united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. All right, good morning. I'm Pastor Joe Williams, and we, you are with me on United with Christ here on Channel 38, and it is a privilege to be here, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. The prayer line for today is 915-532-8518. That's 915-532-8518, and you be uh, just welcome to call in and to have somebody pray for you. This morning, the message that I want to... Uh, to share with you is a message that I did many years ago and I believe the Lord put it on my heart and I, I kind of revamped it a little bit and it, it also reminded me of my quiet time. In my quiet time um, each week as I read through the scripture, I bring reading through First and Second Chronicles, before that I read through Kings and uh, I'm uh, with Ezra and Nehemiah and all the wars and the fighting and uh, uh, so the um, uh, the things that they did in the Old Testament, in a way, reminds me of things that are happening in our nation, uh, in my own personal life, uh, because of some of the decisions I have to make that seem so complicated. And over the last few weeks, uh, in our church and here on United with Christ, I've done some messages on prayer, on planning for the future, on having a vision. And today, what I want you to, to think about is that... This year already, maybe, maybe for many of you, might be a tragic year. This year might be a wonderful year, but in reality, most of the time, it's a mixture. The, the message this morning is entitled, Painful Blessings Ahead. Painful Blessings Ahead. And it's, it's almost like there's a road sign that's warning you. You know what? There's going to be a curve in the road. There's going to be some beautiful things on the side. There's going to be some difficult things. Part of the road is not going to be paved. There's going to be times when there's going to be ice on the road. There's going to be time when you can drive 75, 80 miles an hour down the interstate, and it's going to feel like you're going 35. In, in other words, life is not easy. Right? And life is complicated. So for the believer, I don't want to be an Eeyore. I don't want to tell you that, that every time uh, it begins to rain, that it's a bad time. Or when it, it rains and we, uh, we do need it, we say, oh, thank you. But then when the sun comes out, what would Eeyore say? Oh, now it's going to be so hot. I'm going to be miserable. And yeah, we needed the rain, but now it's going to flood. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you want to become a mature believer so you're ready for anything. And when the joyous moments come and the times that you want to celebrate come, man, you really revel in that time. But knowing that it's not going to last and then you're ready for the challenges to come. Uh, the verse that really I think makes this stand out is from Nehemiah. Let me read a portion of this and some of you who know your Bibles well, you know that Nehemiah was the shortest man in the Bible. He was only knee high, right? Very poor joke. No, Nehemiah was the, the prophet, so to speak, who had been in uh, uh, Babylonia in captivity. And then when the Persians came, Cyrus the Great freed them and they were able to go back after 70 years. Ezra went, Nehemiah went. There was several other people uh, in scripture and they traveled back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the temple. But it was very, very complicated. And the reason that this particular story inspires me is because it's not one of the stories where God just says, you know what, I'm going to save you. Um, uh, like with the Israelites when they were crossing the Red Sea, there was no place for them to go. And it obviously God said, here, I'm going to split the Red Sea. You can cross when the Egyptians tried to cross, the sea closed up. There was nothing that Moses or the Israelites did. I mean, it was an out and out supernatural miracle from God where he interceded. And I believe he can do that today. But in Nehemiah, 
God, he intercedes, he frees the Jews, they get to return, but once they return, they've got to work hard. In fact, they have to work hard in the midst of enemies who try to betray them, talk them out of doing it, who try to discourage them, who take them to court. They actually, in a way, sue the Jews. They send false letters back to the king of Persia saying that the Jews are going to rebuild the walls because they're going to rebel against the Persians. And so it's a very complicated time. They have to have people who are fighting and holding off the enemies around them. They have enemies around them that are kind of part Jewish and part not. People who kind of say, you know what, we want to help you build the wall. And the Jews say, no, you're not doing what you're really supposed to do. They have to purify their own ranks. There are people who have intermarried with the pagans and have started even doing that again. And that's, that's what got them in the mess in the begin with. So it's very, very complicated. But is it ever too complicated for God? No, it's not. Now, let me slow down. And I, I get a little wound up when I begin to share the word. But in my life, already this year, the first few weeks of this new year, all kinds of unusual things have happened, both good and bad, both blessings, and I won't even call them curses, but challenges or attacks from Satan. And there are things that I know I have a definite plan that I think, you know, I, I can do this. I can work this out. My wife and I have, have talked it out. I've talked with my mom and other people in my family. Okay, th this is what I think we need to do. But there are other things in my church and in my life, to be quite honest, are completely out of my control. And that's where it comes into prayer, God interceding and having faith and not being anxious and being a mature believer that understands that this is part of the believer's life until the day they die. We can never just say, I'm looking forward to a time in my life when things settle down and things get better and my life's under control. If you're thinking that, you're going to be disappointed your entire life. I mean, and again, I'm not being negative. I'm being realistic. Now at 61 years old, I'll be 61 next week on my birthday. Um, I understand why a lot of older people sometimes get down and they get depressed about things that are going on in their lives. But at the same time, I know senior adults who are in their late 80s and 90s. And even I, I had a lady I used to visit that lived to be 106 years old. She was always in a positive attitude, not always happy. I mean, she had all kinds of aches and pains and and all kinds of, of, of death in her family, children that had died and grandchildren that had died and all kinds of drama. But she had a mature calmness. She understood that the Holy Spirit would never leave her. She knew that ultimately the only time when she would ever have everything, quote, under control was when she passed from this world and went to be with Jesus. So let me read just a, a few little scriptures. And if you don't get anything else, I want you to, to listen to this part of the story. This is uh, Nehemiah, and this is chapter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 6. And, and here's what he is saying. It's almost like a personal narrative. He says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. You see, God didn't do some miracle and raise up the whole wall. He could have. I mean, God made an axe head float in the water. He does all kinds of miracles, raises the dead. But he brought them back, which was a miracle. But he said, once you get back here, you're going to have to work your tail off. Okay. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that we were to repair Jerusalem's walls and that it had gone ahead, that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God. So they prayed. They had enemies, both inside and out. They prayed. But they also posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So I won't get into all the details, but whatever's going on in your life right now, whether it's financial, whether it's in your family and it's uh, marital problems or you're single and there's all kinds of things going on in our lives. 
health problems. Yes, we go to doctors, we go to lawyers, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we go to accountants, we, we go to counselors. But we always know that we first go in prayer. We go in prayer, and then once God tells us what to do, He may tell us what you're going to do. You're going to be blessed, but it's going to be a painful blessing. And you're going to go through suffering, and you're going to have people who are going to betray you. People in your own church sometimes. We're, we're, we're just people. I mean, we are sinful people in church. And one of the things I want to tell you is that whatever church you go to, don't expect everybody to be perfect. Don't expect everybody to meet your needs. I, I know in, in our own church, we've had several people who have passed away and people are on hospice just in the last few weeks. And when these things happen, this is when it reminds me of my own family, my own life. All of our families, we all have challenges and none of our families are perfect, and none of our church families are perfect. So what do we do? Well, we accept the blessings, we go ahead with what God tells us to do, and then we have the mature outlook that says, Lord, whatever happens, I'm going to follow you in faith. And that's what they did. They posted a guard. Now listen to how they did this. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. Have you ever worked so hard and you just said, forget it. I can't do it anymore. Whether it was physical, okay, or whether it was spiritual or mental or all three, you work so hard. I'll, I'll just give you a little example in our lives. We, we're trying to do what the Bible says on our finances. We try to uh, do what some of these really uh, intelligent uh, Bible teachers in, in, uh, uh, in finances say, like Dave Ramsey. And, and we try to get really uh, focused on getting out of debt, having an emergency fund, savings, tithing to the church, and trying to do everything right. Still, things happen. I mean, we had some, I won't share with you, and, and some of you have, you would laugh at some of my problems, but some things happened to us that came totally unexpectedly, and my plans, I thought, ah, they're shot. No, they're not shot, because it just makes me go back to the principles of God, praise God for the blessings ahead, look back at my mistakes, because a lot of things that have happened to me or because poor decisions or mistakes that I made or I didn't listen to the Lord, now I'm going to go forward. Why, why were the Jews in captivity? Because of their sins. If you look back, you can see before Nehemiah and Ezra in the books, and you can read in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, how Josiah, he was one of the kings that his father and grandfather were very ungodly men. Manasseh was one of them. And yet Josiah followed the Lord. God blessed him. But God even told him, when you die, the Israelites are going to go into captivity, in particular Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And the, uh, the fact of it was, right after Josiah died, his son and one of his brothers rebelled, and they were sold into captivity, and they went to Babylon. The city was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and they were in captivity for 70 years. They brought this on themselves. I'm, I'm not trying to beat you up, but I'm being honest. In my life, when I look at most of the problems in my life, it's because I have made poor decisions or ungodly decisions. Now, there are times when I feel like Job. I feel like I've done everything right, and I still have bad things happen to me. Well, that's the way real life is. So again, painful blessings ahead. Be mature. Be focused. In fact, say, Lord, you know what? I can do nothing in my strength, but with your strength, whatever is ahead, I'm going to be ready for it. Um, and here's what happened towards the end here. I, I, I know I always almost run out of time here, but let me read to you a few more things in, in Nehemiah here. Nehemiah is, is lamenting to the Lord. He says, Our enemy said before they know it or see us, we will be right among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Physical violence and death. Now, most of us don't face that, but we face enemies in our life who want to put an end to our work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. 
Therefore, I station some of the... Now, let me pause there. Do you have people in your life that every time you try to make a new change in your life or do the right thing, it ain't going to work? I mean, there's too much against you. Just give up. Or you failed so many times. Just, just give up like Job's wife. I mean, we don't want to be that way. You and I also want to be the person who looks at someone else who is maybe in a, in a terrible state uh, of what's going on in their life, but you don't, you don't pander to them and, and sugarcoat things, but you never tell them that God can't intervene and make changes in their life. I, I, I just spoke to a man this week in our church that was telling one of the other pastors and myself about being in prison about being in prison for years and years and all the things that happened to him and, and all the sinful things that he'd gotten into and had God did a miracle, redeemed his life and got him out of prison and now he's serving the Lord. Then he began to serve the Lord and he had an accident and now he's confined to a wheelchair. Why? Why after God took him out of prison and then now he's in a wheelchair after he's serving the Lord, because that is the way real life is. Now, the beautiful thing about it is this man's not bitter about being in the wheelchair. He knows that God has been merciful to him and that in the end, man, he's going to walk and run again when he gets to heaven. Let me finish here with Nehemiah. Now, when our enemies heard what we were doing, they were angry. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. Now, after looking things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Now, listen to this for your brothers, your sisters, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Wow. Is that exciting? I mean, some of you young people today, if you're listening to this, you're looking for a cause. Man, what better cause than to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? And you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your community, for your church, for your mother, your father, your brothers, and your sisters. You are fighting, spiritually at least speaking, to the death. One group of the people, they stood at the breaches in the wall and they guarded the others who worked with the stones and the masonry and, and the, however they repaired the wall so they could protect them. So you pray, you plan, you have faith, but man, you work hard. Listen to the next part. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. You see, we need each other. Everybody had each other's back. Everybody worked hard. And if one person failed to do their job, they harmed the other people. What does Paul tell us if we go forward to the New Testament? He says that we are all one body. We need each other. No matter what part of the body you are, you are important. When, Paul tells us, now here's the blessings, when you're doing well and God's blessing you and things are going great in your life, you are a blessing to other people. And they should glory in the good things that happen in your life. Uh, if any pastors are out there, please, it is a temptation for myself and other pastors. Don't be jealous when other churches are blessed and God is doing great things in them. All right? Just, man, I'm part of that. We're all part of the body, and I'm so glad that your church is being blessed. In your individual life, I'm so glad right now that God is blessing you financially, your marriage, your children. Don't be jealous because maybe you are going through a tough time. Instead, say, okay, Lord, when it's my time, when, when things turn around for me, I want others to glory in what God is doing for me because I accept the good and the bad in my life because it all, now listen to this, it all brings glory to Jesus Christ. Almost finished with Nehemiah here. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. 
Is your work today extensive and spread out? Are your problems and your challenges complicated? Oh, yes, they are. And are they widely separated from each other along the wall? Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So now, even all the organization, even all the passion and the power of the Jews as they defended each other, even then, it was beyond their ability to accomplish. They had to listen to the trumpet. Now, whose trumpet call do we listen to? We listen to the trumpet call of Jesus. Amen. And when Jesus comes back, we're going to hear that trumpet. But now, right now, we listen to the voice of our precious Holy Spirit. We read the scripture and we ask Holy Spirit, tell me what to do in this situation. It's above my head. It's beyond my comprehension. I don't have the power to do this. But Lord, you intervene. And that's what the people did. About three more verses and we'll be finished. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the light of dawn till the stars came out. Do you think they were exhausted mentally and physically? Oh, yes, they were. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workmen by day. You need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to be amongst people who will love you. You need to be in a care group, a Bible, a Bible study group, a fellowship, whatever your, your church calls these small groups, because you need people. You need their protection. All right? And you need their encouragement. You need the accountability to live the godly life. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Wow, what a word picture. Now, does that mean you're never to take a bath and you're, you're, you're not to change? Of course not. Okay, But what it means is this. You need to be on the alert all the time. D did you know that and I'm, I, I don't think this is hyperbole, okay? Uh, I, when I go to a meeting, even if I think a meeting with the person is just a relaxed luncheon and I'm looking forward to seeing them and there, there's no topic that is, uh, uh, you know, difficult or, and, and there's no conflict or anything, I still pray. Because sometimes when you least expect it, that's when you're blindsided. You go to meet somebody and you think it's going to be a nice little lunch and they just let you have it. Or they tell you some terrible thing. I've got cancer. I've lost my job. My husband's cheating on me. My wife's cheating on me. My children are on drugs. And you're not ready. So we are to be ready in season and out of season. We are to teach and preach in season and out of season. So I always pray every meeting I go to, whether I think it's a serious meeting or not. Some of you are listening today. You've been blindsided and things have happened to you and you reacted and you failed because you weren't ready. You weren't prepared. So at the end here, there's about three or four minutes left. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to accept this new year and whatever is going on in your life, even at this moment, no matter how painful it could be or matter how joyful it is right now and say, Lord, I thank you, God, that you made me. You made me for this moment, in this time, in this place. And I'm going to take joy in the good and the bad and in the painful blessings because I know you love me. I'm trusting in you. And Lord, I'm going to serve you. You tell me how many hours to work. You tell me what to do, what not to do. Help me with every single decision with my children, my grandchildren, here in my church, whatever you tell me to do. Isn't that beautiful? You know, um, it makes me think, and there's, there's three minutes left. Here, here's what I, I want you to do. It makes me think, and I, hopefully it'll make you think, about all that's going on in your life right now. And what I want you to do, I want you to think about the things that you think that you can control and fix. I want you to make some plans to fix those things, all right? To work at it, little goals. But then I also want you to think about the things that are beyond your repair. That is where God takes the glory. I mean, you may say, you know what? For 25 years, I've been trying to reconcile with so-and-so, and I can't forgive them. I just don't think it's going to work. That's when you say, Lord, repair those walls. Tell me what to do. 
or maybe you've been sick for years and years and, and God hasn't healed you. Say, Lord, I, I've given up on the doctors and the medicines and everything. You're going to have to heal me. Or, or maybe, and, and again, I, I'm not being negative, but I, I'm, I'm looking at it as a mature Christian. Lord, I've asked you to heal me and, and you're not going to heal me. And that's okay. Whatever time you give me right now, then I'm going to take it. Help me to witness to the people around me. Help me to be good to the doctors, the nurses, my family, whatever's going on in your life. Glory in the painful blessings, whatever it happens to be. Let me end with the last minute here just, just to pray for you. Again, you can call in and pray here, and lots of people will pray for you. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much, Father. Lord, we glory in your name. Lord, we glory in the painful blessings, the challenges, Lord, uh, the, the joys and the things that give us uh, such happiness, God. But we also, Lord, we, we, we give you uh, our faith, Lord, and, and everything that you want us to do, Lord, even in the things that are painful, Lord. So, Father, I ask that you would give people strength right now to guide them, Lord. Uh, Lord, I, I ask that you would uh, answer their prayers, God whether it's yes, now, or no, whatever you want us to do, Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day and a great new year. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I, I ask, I'm, I'm looking at the, the time here, Lord. i got 24 seconds. I thought we were out of time there, so let's pray one more time. Lord, I ask that you bless the people who are, are right now struggling. And Father, I ask that you would uh, give them the wisdom Lord, Lord, I ask that you give them the guidance, God, and that you give them the strength in everything they need to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys.